Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by the subscribers and supporters of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a supporter, thank you very much for your ongoing support. And if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts and writing from our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Well, today I am very pleased to be talking with my friend Amanda Lean. Hi, Amanda. Hello. Amanda is a technology copywriter and a sci-fi author, which is pretty fun. And really cool. <laughs> um, I know you also identify as queer, which is another, you know, bonding bit between us. Right. right. Um, the two of us connected through dreamers and doers. It seems like, you know, I only know people either through medium or, or dreamers <laughs> and doers. And it's actually true. I have no, no actual friends, no true friends. Well, let's let's actually get to the topic. Today, we were going to talk about representation in, in fiction. Um, the reason Amanda and I were going to talk about this is kind of funny. We talked about anime, I, I believe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which, and neither of us is like a like an expert on anime. But but one thing, because I know I mentioned um, Sailor Moon. I know I mentioned Sailor Moon to you, which, by the way, I just started Re well, not just, but like a couple of weeks ago, I started rereading the whole thing because I was like, I, I don't know, I just have to do it every so often. Sure. And it's truly amazing for, you know, I mean, just anime in general, somewhat difficult, you know, to, to, to pick out lots of representation. It's very mm -hmm. monochromatic. Um, so we're going to talk about representation. But um, but actually, I, I want to ask one question first, because professionally, um, you know, as a, as a copywriter for, for tech companies, like that's gotta be different. It's gotta be difficult. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get to the point where we say representation, even in technical copywriting, because you, I had a great conversation with Lindsay Tabus recently about being a woman in technology and you're mm -hmm. adding on top of that, a queer identity, um, so let me stop talking. Can can you can you? I mean, what's it? What is, what is the effect of of your identity on on technical? You know, the copywriting you got to do. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about this recently from the perspective of like the work that I do. I will be honest. Um, I, for reasons largely due to there are some members of my family that I don't want knowing that I'm queer. I don't often publicly link my identity to the work that I do. Um, this is the I first see. time I've actually done so in, in so many words, which is totally fine. Um, it's, I, I, I kind of, I call it the, if you know, you know, effect. There have been a lot of times when I've been, um, in the room, zoom room, usually with clients, um, you know, gathering information for a case study, crafting a white paper, working on like a web redesign and all the copy, whatever have you. And there's, there's sometimes a moment when like a project manager or a product person, uh, or someone else, you know, hops into the chat and, uh, there's kind of this moment of like, you know, are you, you know, like, oh, are you like, you kind of like look at each other and just, you know, uh, I I've seen before, um, you know, a, a PM hop into the chat and, and she just casually mentions her wife. And then there's this moment of like the two of us kind of virtually locking eyes and be like, oh, okay. Like this is, and you know, it, it's always funny to me when that happens because I've, um, I, obviously you should never judge a book by its cover, but I have, sure. and I've tried to orchestrate my physical appearance where it's kind of like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. If you know, you know, but if you don't, you're going to look at me and see, you know, a, a cishet white girl doing her job. And if you know, then it's like, okay, she has the, she has the bisexual bob or whatever, uh, whatever people might, you know, apparently you can tell if you know what you're looking at, according to my friends and my sister. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's interesting as well. It's nice to see in the, you know, I've been doing this for five years, uh, almost six, and it's been nice to see an uptick in the amount of casual queerness that has been present in the space. Um, Agreed. you know, just yeah. even just casually mentioning, you know, my wife, my partner, um, you know, the, sim the simple implementation of gender neutral language for a partner or a spouse is quite nice to see. Um, by and large, the, 
this is something I'm prioritizing in 2024 is working with more diverse uh, tech organizations uh, in terms of both in terms of, of actual makeup and then in terms of um, the work that they're doing so far, it's been a lot of like B2B SaaS <laughs> companies and mm-hmm. they, it's not, I get, I'm generalizing here, but they tend to attract a certain, um, you know, kind of group of, of people that are not necessarily yes. aligned with what I want to support long-term. Most of my clients have come through referrals. So you like-minded people tend to stick together. So this year I'm trying to prioritize doing more outreach and actual marketing instead of just doing the leads and connections bit. Um, but it's been Interesting enough, like you said, being a woman in the space, because often in the Zoom room, I am the only woman or one of two. Um, sure, sure. And there's, there, it's been interesting, the expectations. I'll never forget, there was one time I actually got to meet a client in person. Uh, this was a few years ago, uh, pre, pre-pandemic. We got to hang out in person, and he clearly was surprised, not in a negative way, just surprised by something about me. And I remember asking him like what it was and he, that, you know, I was like, you seem like you like, you weren't expecting something about me. He was like, yeah, I don't know. I just, I thought that you'd be like more, more feminine. And I was like, fair, I guess, I guess I give off those vibes. Um, I, I was just wearing like a flannel and cuffed jeans. And I don't know if it makes it funnier or not, but at the time I did not know that I was queer. Uh, I had not realized this about myself, but the signs, I guess, were sure there, uh, which is very funny to this day to me. Um, but they always, no, they are. They're, <laughs> they're always there. Yeah. That's yeah. Look, looking back, there's a whole host of things I should have, mm-hmm. but anyway, it's, it was very interesting. Um, even even in college, you know, I went to journalism school for undergrad. I have a master's in creative writing. Uh, the master's was acquired uh, remotely because it was during the pandemic, but I, I did sure. the, the undergrad college thing. And um, in school, there was very much this archetype thrust upon you of what a journalist, a reporter should be, look like. And it was very much about um, be neutral, you know, nothing about what you wear, say, do, da-da-da, should be considered like a political statement. And then came in that question of, of you know, is if you are queer and choose to reflect that, you know, visually in, in the way that you dress, cut your hair, whatever, um, is that considered a political statement, quote unquote? And mm-hmm. my attitude was always, how, what does, as long as you conduct yourself professionally and adorn yourself professionally, the way that you cut your hair, wear your makeup or not, do your nails or not, that's just adornments. That's stuff. It doesn't have a gender. It doesn't have a sexuality. Like, you know what? It's fashion. Yeah. I have, I, yes, I, I have, I have cis head, you know, white guy friends to use the internet's terms who wear makeup that I don't. They, they wear the, one of my friends, he is a heterosexual guy with a fiance. My man wears under eye concealer every day to work because he's got chronic insomnia and he's got a, he feels oh better gosh. when he's got it on and people, you know, some people have made fun of him for it. And he's like, but it's just a tool. It's a tool like a, like, you know, a razor to shave one's beard. Why is that acceptable yeah. for me? And the makeup is not. So, you know, it's all just stuff. And I, um, that's kind of how I maneuver through the world is, you know, my, and, and working, I think, in the tech space a lot has kind of helped me hone this approach of like, you know, my my gender, my sexuality, whatever I choose to adore myself. That is in this in this professional space. That's the least interesting thing about me. I, I what's interesting is the ability to do my job. What's interesting to you guys should be um, paying me well for the job that I do, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. And then you know, when I choose to talk about it, then it can be interesting. <laughs> but to my clients, it's like this. You don't need to care about it. But it has been nice to really see the the unfolding of more representation, more diversity, the people who are in the rooms when, because when I'm having these conversations, it's about marketing. It's about, you know, sharing impact to bring in more customers, clients, whatever. So it's nice to see that there's more diversity in the room that where the conversations about impact and advertising and marketing and client acquisition are happening because the hope is that that will then kind of calcify into more diversity in the groups that they're working with and they're supporting. And it's all a self-feeding engine, especially in in tech, you know, B2B SaaS. So, uh, so many more often than not in certain industries or with certain clients, when I pop into the zoom room and uh, like most recently it was, it was a skincare brand that a woman owned skincare brand. And they had been in conversation with my, my, uh, one of my clients and it was overwhelmingly male owned and operated company. And so the, the relief on the co-founder's face when I popped into the Zoom room and I'm 
visibly, you know, a woman assigned female at birth. It was right. immense. She was like, okay. And she actually said to me, she was like, I'm so glad that you're a woman because you're going to get it in a way that I can't, I couldn't really like figure out how to explain to a guy. And so, you know, that kind of got my wheels turning in my brain of like, okay, clearly like how many, how many women, how many people of color, how many queer people have that feeling in the tech space right. of, you know, right. oh, like I want, you know, I need marketing efforts. I want marketing efforts. I want support, but is, is someone going to get it? Like, is this going to be? And so that's part of why I want to, if there is that niche fill, you know, and while, you know, I can't, um, I, you know, I can't understand, you know, I can't step into the shoes, you know, in, in real life, you know, of being a person of color. I'm, I'm not, um, I am queer and I am a woman. So I've got two of those boxes ticked and I, I understand how to maneuver through the world with respect and provide people who don't look like me, the respect and dignity that they deserve. And unfortunately that is a problem in tech in a lot of areas, but tech is one of them. Very much. And so, oh, very much. you know, I, I, I realize, oh, clearly this is a need and I want to be able to be a resource and a support system to people who you know, feel that because, you know, women in tech, queer people in tech, BIPOC individuals in tech, they're doing amazing things and they deserve marketing skills. They deserve copywriters who are sensitive, who are culturally aware, who are willing to collaborate, who aren't, you know, full of the, the, you know, male ego that seems so prevalent in the tech space and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not saying I am the answer, but I could be a answer. So in, in 2024, that's, I'm trying to focus on, uh, not necessarily a rebrand, because if you talk to me long enough on a client call, you know this is what I'm about, but being intentional and open about it and saying, hey, yeah. if you are a tech company who is women owned and operated, queer owned and operated, BIPOC owned and operated, like, you know, come on down. Like, I, you know, I have your back. I'm not going to be, you know, any type of way to you. I'm just happy to be here and I want to help you tell your story. So, um, yeah, it, it, the the moment of like, just like, you know, with, with queer folks, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. If you know, you know, being a woman too, you yeah. pop into the zoom. It's like, Oh, thank God. Like, okay, you're going to get it. And that's nice, but it's sure. also, it's, it shouldn't sure. be that way. And that makes me sad that this is where we are, but if it is where we are, I'm going to do my part to move the needle. Um, because everyone deserves to have an equal seat at the table and an equal shot at having a voice. And we're, we're closer to that reality than when we started and we have a ways to go, but that's life. There's a, I, I, I forget the attribution of the quote, but there's a, um, part of a, a quote, a, a friend who's Jewish sent to me, cause I believe it was a rabbi who said it, but, um, it's, uh, you're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. And that's kind of how I live my life of like, I, I alone can't change the world and that's fine. I'm one human being, but I, I'm not going to sit back on my laurels and just let yeah. things happen around me without saying something, um, whether it's in copywriting or in my fiction writing or just in my everyday life as right. like a person. Right. So there's my spiel. Right. <laughs> Oh, it was a great spiel for what it's worth. Do you, you know what's interesting though? Because, because, uh, because I mean, you know, I got my first tech job in 1998. It was the last century, if you can believe. That was the that. year I was born. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, in case listeners were trying to do mental math, I wanted to help them out. Like, yeah, that was the year I was born. <laughs> sorry. No, I'm. No, it's okay. No, I totally. I know I'm totally. I know I'm totally old, and it's okay. I mean, normally people don't like rub it in my face, but you know, that's <laughs> cool. <clears throat> I think I'm gonna move on. My bad. No, I'm just kidding, Amanda, honestly, nobody. So, but I started in 1998 and I thought, um, but you know, it, it seems like things have actually gotten worse in many ways. And it's weird to think that, you know, 25 years ago, we could be, better but but it seems like um you know with some of the polarization some mm -hmm. with with the polarization of of you know the political climate um you know it seems like gender and sexuality 25 years ago people were like can you can you write code can you do the job and like that was more important now i think that was day-to-day -day interactions you, you know mm -hmm. very clearly you know, we didn't, you know, there were, there was a, a, a distinct lack of sensitivity mm -hmm. around gender and sensitivity and what was, what was going out. Mm -hmm. Um, even if you just look at, you know, color blindness, whatever, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, something that it's like, you know, com completely biological, not even, you know, um, having to do with, with, um, identity. So mm -hmm. anyway, so it's, it's interesting. It seems like things have actually gotten better and worse at the same time and and 
Well, it, it reminds me because you you had mentioned prior to the recording that you were reading you were rereading Sailor Moon, and this is a weird thing that I know because mm-hmm. my friend told me. So um, right now I'm watching with my friend uh, an anime, and the creator of the manga upon which the anime is built, he's actually married to Sailor Moon's creator. Oh, sure. And right. yeah, so he he made an anime slash manga called Yu Yu Hakusho, and it's very '90s and it's very aggressively '90s. Um, but <laughs> one of the things that I've enjoyed about it is there's a surprising amount of gender neutrality and nonsense mm. that is mm-hmm. just there. Um, there's one episode that we did skip because the language did not age well. Um, it, mm. it definitely reads as as being tinged with transphobia now. Um, because it didn't age well but outside of that like there's there's one scene that kills me every time i think about it It just makes me bust out laughing where a a character is addressing a stadium full of people and because he is aware that there are some uh individuals that are genderless in in the space for lack of a better phrase his addressment is ladies and gentlemen and other stuff because he's a teenage boy in the 90s but but it's it's just there it's very casual um there's 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 two um there's there's one character who is addressed uh, as a as a as a lord and with he him pronouns up until the fact that uh, this character takes the mask off and is revealed to actually be a woman and then everyone switches it up and it's no problem there's no like jokes made about you know anything it just it is what it is it's part of a yeah. big reveal and it's very casual and it's funny in a lot of ways because at this core like at the core it's you know there's there's teenagers in the nineties fighting demons and whatever. But it was also interesting. One thing that I really appreciated about that particular story is I remember like, I, I, you know, I didn't, as mentioned, I didn't grow up in the nineties, but I've heard, I've been around enough to have heard things. And one of the things that I knew historically was a problem from the representation perspective was like only the villains were queer. That was like the thing, only the villains were queer. Right. And, yes. and, I, I was watching this anime and there was a, a moment where uh, one of the two people trying to, it's very, this is a very complicated anime really, but the, the bottom line is that these two, two quote unquote villains are trying to, well, one guy's trying to end the world as we know it. The other guy's helping him. The guy who's like helping him is very openly like, yeah, I'm, I'm really into this guy. I'm, I'm helping him. Yeah. But he's also hot and it's not, it's not positioned as you are evil. This guy's evil because he's queer. He's just a bad guy who also happens to have a super gay crush on his co-villain. Um, okay. It doesn't. And, and like, I, I appreciate that within the, for lack of a better word, repertoire available at the time, the creator of this story is like, I just pepper some representation in there. And it's, it's positioned yeah. also as like, almost like the doomed lovers thing. Like it, ultimately one guy ends up dead and the other guy uh, is just going to, uh, he 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 has a very sad end as well but it has nothing to do with the queerness it's just like let's just pepper in the fact that they are gay from yeah. the perspective of like dude to top off everything else you're doing you're into some guy who doesn't like you back now that's just sad like can anything go like work well for you and i i right. with right. with the repertoire you had to work with i appreciate that again it wasn't you're a villain because you're queer it was just you are a villain you also happen to be queer and then there's also you know several there's at least two that I can think of male characters that have feminine features that look quote unquote, like girls. No one makes fun of them. No one says anything about it. I'm sitting there going, ah, this is fun to look at because I am the stereotypical bisexual who likes pretty guys. Um, but so, you know, again, this was the nineties and there's a lot that, that was not maybe ideal by the, the current standard, but I appreciated it for what it was and I'm glad that it exists and the story is really funny and um, ladies and gentlemen and other stuff will never not take me out (laughs) laughing because it's like, it's, it's giving, it's giving teenage boy trying so hard to be inclusive because that's what was happening. And it was very, it was very endearing. (laughs) You know, it's funny, but I I forgot that, uh, that the guy is married. I don't want to try to say her name because I will absolutely murder it. But, um, it's just all through because Sailor Moon is really, really like very, like very gender. I mean, like everybody mm-hmm. is feminine. I mean, everybody mm-hmm. doesn't make a difference who you are in the story. You're feminine. You know, yep. the most masculine people still pretty feminine. Yeah. Which like you is sort of the typical pansexual. I'm, you know, yeah. effeminate men are, are sort of my thing. But um, if it's going to be men. Um, yep. My point was going to be is just be that that because uh, I mean there's even like one of the the sailor 
um, Guardians, Sailor Uranus, you first meet her, him, I because it's you know I, there's really very few pronouns that that get thrown around mm -hmm. in the in the the manga too, um, but it's like a race car driver and like you know gives gives a lady a rose I think it is I'm trying to remember the whole thing okay but you're like wow very masculine you know driving his ass down the road and then turns into Sailor Uranus one of the the Sailor Guardians and has you know earrings and and through you know two or three um like large volumes so across you know um probably 10, 10 or 10 to 30 probably maybe 30 manga issues you know you start off going oh this is a guy and by the end of it you're like this was never a guy it was, just, it was always a she and that was just like she was fucking around <laughs> going yeah 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 i'm kind of masculine but you know does don't even don't don't overthink this i'm just so, here don't worry about it like it's fine don't worry yeah, about it yeah yeah yeah. But, but, you know, you come you come upon a really so I've appreciated that being because mm -hmm. you're right. But, you know, not that long ago, every transgender character was like the villain. You know, mm -hmm. you've got um, what was his name? Willem Dafoe. And I can't think of the movie. It's it's not that important, but there's a movie where he's like a, a train, you know, a transvestite serial killer. No, and great. You go, well, he's a serial. Yeah, you're like, well, he's a serial killer because he's a transvestite. And then, mm -hmm. you know, looking at the Silence of the Lambs, another, which incidentally, a book I was fascinated with. And I'll tell you why I was so fascinated with it because, you know, Clarice Starling in this, I've read it many times and I love that movie partly because of Jodie Foster. Her, her, her portrayal of Clarice Starling was just so mm -hmm. loved it. But moving on. Um, James Gum, that particular character, you know, Cl Clarice Starling figures out he wants to make a suit out of women's skin because mm -hmm. supposedly, supposedly wants to be a woman. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading that and watching that and going, that's not how that works. No. <laughs> like, it's not <laughs> right. even close to how that works. No. And, and so, but that actually, for what it's worth, made it better for me because i was like mm -hmm. not only you know this the character is being portrayed with some weird weird gender issues but then at the end of it i went but that's since that's not how that works like this is just a really whacked out person mm -hmm. so i don't know that amplified it for me but i know there are other transgender people who are like oh i can't even don't even don't put the word silence and lambs in the same sentence in fact mm -hmm. i don't want to talk about lambs how about this just give me <laughs> silence yeah there you go <laughs> yeah and it's also i i i have while i'm on the anime kick there's also slash manga so um i have not seen many anime in my life i've read even fewer manga um i have Same. but one of one of the anime that i did watch because so many people were talking about it and i like to know what the fuss is about about things is i did sure. watch the famous or infamous depending on who you are attack on titan and mm -hmm. um it, it, they did a lot the story did a lot wrong it shamelessly played into the barrier gaze trope in a very messed up way and sure. I, I remember seeing that and being like, how did you get this so wrong? But another piece of representation was done very well. And that is that in it's more prevalent in the manga. And I have thoughts about this too. So there's like two parts of this in the manga. There is a character. This is a main character, a character that is, is most of the story uh, is present. Um, so not a side character, not a throwaway character, but they, uh, in the, in every translation, the, that this was the story was ever done. There were many translations. This is very popular. The creator was adamant that gender neutral pronouns be used for this character. It was an okay. intentional creation of a non-binary character in this massive mega, you know, mega popular manga. And the character is intentionally drawn in the manga gender neutral. Uh, the creator was like, you can decide whatever gender this character is for yourself. The name is gender neutral and sounds a bit weird on purpose because this character is absolutely unhinged. It's great. But, and, and, and that was like quality representation of like the gender is irrelevant. What matters is that this person is who they are and is doing these things that they're doing. And, um, 
is sometimes the glue, but never the brain cell that holds the group together. Um, <laughs> which is funny because they're literally a scientist. They they have they have a lot of um, intelligence, not a lot of street smarts. It's great, but sure, they sure. Um, yeah. no no in, spoilers because in... because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who haven't seen Attack on Titan. Oh yeah, no, so. I'm not saying anything. But this this character, <laughs> oh, but the thing the thing that got but... me was in the anime. This character is drawn, animated, and voiced. The, a woman voices this character, and they're drawn more like feminine than masculine. I see. And I that see. was a bit interesting to encounter because in the manga, it's very much gender neutral. Like they they don't like looking at this person. You wouldn't know. You couldn't even begin to guess, which is the point. And sure. But then I also found it interesting that somewhere along the line, someone involved in the the anime might have been like, you know what, this character is going to be more what palatable, yeah. interesting, whatever as a feminine present and, and like she her yeah. pronouns are used in 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 a lot of the anime captions and it's interesting because again this is a scientist who's in a military position of power who is a shot caller who is an executive decision maker you would think sure. that perhaps you know going by history this would lean toward maybe we should draw this person somebody. more masculine you know yeah. whatever but instead and i thought that that was both simultaneously pretty cool and kind of because it's also like hey why didn't you just keep with the the but they're whatever yeah. It's very interesting, um, and I, I enjoyed that character immensely. They're they're yeah. unhinged and delightful in how I would like to maneuver through the world in many ways. But it was really interesting to me to like learn this information, um, and and but also very refreshing to encounter a character where it's like my gender is irrelevant. What is important, however, is this information that I'm going to sit down and make you hear for ten hours straight, which is the kind of person this character is. And that was really sure. refreshing um, as someone who grew up watching action movies where the only uh, female characters were like the femme fatales who were only valued for their sex appeal or of whatever. Course. It was a nice um, right. in, in action adventure anime to see the difference. Um, and yeah. in, in the sci-fi I read to see that difference. And um, I have a, this behind me is a Mad Max Fury Road stylized poster, oh, which yeah. is the reason why I am like this is that particular movie. Um, <laughs> so I, that should tell you something I, probably. I wanna, Cause didn't you, you said you're, like you and your dad would watch these movies, right? So it was like Mad Max. I remember. Um, yeah, was I grew it also up. James James Bond films were other big ones. Yeah, so I grew yeah, up okay. on I grew up on the Mission Impossible films, the okay. the James Bond trilogy, the the James Bond films, and growing up, it was always kind of like. You know, because I was watching these films going, okay, that's nice. We're all the girls. Even Star Wars, yeah. that was the other thing that I grew mm -hmm. up on. And again, oh, only sure. one woman, really. And I was like, okay, again, what's the deal? I remember being, um, being, oh, I must have been like 11 or 12, uh, watching on my uh, at my granddad's house the VHS tape of um, Return of the Jedi and sure, seeing sure. the infamous scenes of Princess Leia in the gold bikini and going, uh, pointing at the screen and to my mom, like, what's the point of this? Like, no. where are her clothes at? Like, yeah. you know, and that was, and that was part of a byproduct of how I grew up. You know, I was, mm -hmm. I was very much raised, you know, that I can do, you know, what anything a boy can do. Like there was no like, Oh, that's for right. boys in my right. household. That was not a thing. Right. Um, and so, you know, getting older, it was kind of like, okay, there's not, and even in the books that I read at the time, um, I loved fantasy. I love sci-fi. But at that time in YA fantasy and sci-fi, not a lot of female protagonists, not a lot of female main characters sure. Um, sure. to the point where I got it was very disconcerting to me. I was like, where are the girls? Like, what is going on here? And so when I was in I was 17, I was yeah, 16 or 17, because Fury Road came out in like 2015 and um my, I had never shut up about this. In high school, all my friends were guys, so they were sick of hearing about it, probably. Um, and I, one of them went to the theater and saw this film and was texting me like, you need to go watch this movie. It's going to change your life. And I was kind of like, okay, whatever. Uh, and, and I, cause I knew what the original Mad Max trilogy was about. And I, I had no oh, really sure. interest in, in a reboot. I was yeah. like, okay, like, all right. Um, and sh went in there and walked out of the theater like, oh, this is everything that I've ever wanted out of this genre. Okay, now I know what I'm allowed to ask for. And for reasons adjacent to, I had other representational desires um, for why I was trying to tell the story that no one else is going to apparently give me. And so I, I was trying to ironically write a manuscript, a, a novel, 
that now exists. Um, but I wanted one that felt like an action film that felt like a sci-fi action film, but, I, but I wasn't sure if anyone would want that in this world. And like, you know, 17 sure, year old sure. me had no clue about, you know, anything at that point, but I walked out of the movie being like, okay, clearly, clearly people want this. So people I felt very it. empowered yeah. and it was refreshing to see a female character where the least interesting thing about her was her gender. It was zero. She, she yeah, could have been a guy sure. and could have done all the same exact things, but it was made that much more impactful because she was a woman. And yeah. uh, that was really fun and nice to see. And, um, you know, fast forward multiple years and I wrote the, and the reason I wrote the book was because I was tired also of no, chronic illness or disability representation in sci-fi. There was very little, there still is very little. Um, sure. and you know, when you, when you walk around as a chronically ill child and you're reading as much as I was reading and you're watching, you know, as much film and TV as I was, and you don't see your experiences represented, it's kind of like, okay, well, something has to change. And my attitude is always, I'm going to complain about something. I better, I better be invested in solving the problem. So sure. I, I, I am attempting to solve the problem. <laughs> That's awesome. I try. <laughs> I don't know. I want to follow up on this. It's going to take me a second to get there because there were a few things that you mentioned that in, a, in a, another um, aspect that I wanted to bring in um, that you're doing something, first of all, is phenomenal. You know, <laughs> I, you. I think there's a lot of, well, I mean, I think there's a lot of, well, the world's messed up. And then you go, well, right, let's fix it. And people go, oh, do you, well, yeah. I mean, because... I don't know. You do it, I guess. I don't, mm -hmm. but you had mentioned, so, so the infamous, you know, job of the hut scene with, with Carrie Fisher and the, the metal bikini and everything. Um, there was, then there was a, a, I don't know if public outcry is the right word for this, but like when the, the sequel trilogy came out, the idea that there could be like a, a female Jedi, right? You have mm -hmm. Ray, now oh yes um, i remember that vividly oh my word oh yeah Pe people are like wait what the flying hell you know this is not luke's luke skywalker was cool but here we have like this you know kind of kind of boring looking lady and what's funny is i saw that and just went yeah okay i mean right you got a jedi i mean she's a jedi is the thing like who i'm mm -hmm. like whether whether there's an s or not in front of you know she's a jedi yeah like meant nothing to me but right we had talked before and this is long ago i think um with the earth sea series as well like ursula mm -hmm. Le Guin's um earth sea series i think it's in the second book I, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly i think it's the second book which i looked up published in 1970 i can't remember how how Le Guin puts it but i believe the main character so ged is looking at, i think he's looking up at the sun and smiles and she mentions bright teeth and his dark skin and dark eyes in 1970 apparently because she wrote like an afterword or a, a forward mm -hmm. to to the the edition that i have where she said in 1970 this was a big reveal mm -hmm. that people are like well hang on you have a main character and he's a wizard and he's the hero and he's black Mm -hmm. How she got work? slammed. I remember Ooh, reading yes. about that in grad school. She got absolutely harangued for daring to publicly say, you know, I, I don't think that every single fantasy should be Eurocentric and based on like the medieval <laughs> right. times in white Europe. Like this is silliness. Yeah. And people just when yeah they went they they attacked, they flayed her and and i'm sitting here going like well look a lot, a lot of good that did you didn't destroy her career. She's been doing this for decades. But yeah, it was nuts, right. insane. So. So I finally backed into the question. It took a while. I told you it was going to take a bit, but so the question, I mean, so what is like, in your opinion, as, especially as, as a, as a fiction writer, like what is, what is appropriate? Like what is representation? What does that even mean? I use the word appropriate and I'm not sure if that's, you know, what would be good representation? Cause I, cause I have a follow up on after that, but like what's good representation in fiction? I mean, to me, it's, acknowledging and depicting the world as it is. And, okay. you know, I, I write, I write speculative sci-fi. I write sci-fi. that's very near future. The world isn't going to change much. Uh, and, and I, I wrote as part of my graduate level thesis, I wrote something about how, if, 
if you as a sci-fi writer uh, or a fantasy writer or any writer who, who is purporting to craft speculative fiction, because that's the umbrella under which fantasy, sci-fi, horror, they all fall under that. Um, okay. If you're speculating on a world that uh, exists, that inherently cuts out part of the existing universe, you're not doing a very good job. You're not being you know, accurately represent representative. I'm not saying throwing characters in for the sake of saying, you know, oh, I have, you know, I have a queer one. I have a disabled one. Like, don't do that. Cause that's, that's, okay. that's tokenizing in a really hurtful way. But, um, it, it, if it's a natural reflection of the world in which you live, I feel like that representation is, it's good. It's at least good enough. I, I think it's such a personal question as well, because obviously, you know, I, as a white author, I am never going to represent certain elements of certain lived experiences because it's not my story to tell. It's not my place, sure. but because this is all I can really think of to do. Um, the manuscript that I wrote, the the cast of characters, uh, you know, they're they're physically described to the extent that a reader can visualize them. But it's it's a casual. It's just tossed in there. You know, okay, two of them aren't sure, white. Sure. One of them's non-binary and uses they them pronouns. One of them's you know a, a guy from what is supposed to be the American South. Um, and it's just, it's, it's just casually mentioned. It's just part of right. the world. It's right. just an understood fact of the universe, such as the sky is blue and the grass would be green if there were any. And to me, that's the representation that I like to see representation that is casual and just a unique reflection of the world. And, and not the punchline, this is not to drag it back to anime, but my friend recently showed me the first couple episodes of this anime called Oran high school host club, which I gather was really popular a while ago. Um, the main premise is that uh, the main premise and thus the main character is a, a girl who was at first mistaken for a boy just because of the way that she looks. She's, she's kind of um, small, thin, uh, gender androgynous haircut, glasses, a voice that's not too, not too high, not too low, gets clocked sure. as a male. When, when the, the boys that have, for lack of a better word, brought her into the fold realize that she's a girl, they're shocked for all of two seconds, then go, that's okay, we just won't tell anyone. And that's that. And that sort of like casual acceptance written into the universe is what I like to see in my fiction uh, of just, yeah. you know, this is, this is what it is. And we can move on. And that that representation is is nice to see um, because yeah. it doesn't feel that way. That way, no one is othered. There isn't that, you know, because when when you other someone for the sake of representation, to me, that's right. no longer good representation, because okay. in, in, in reality, in the real world people all around us are diverse. People all around us are from different backgrounds, different walks of life. They're different races, different genders, different sexualities, et cetera, et cetera. And it just all is. And that's what sure. I like to see in my fiction is it just is. Um, and I think that we have, or we should have gone well past the time of uh, needing to acknowledge that, you know, this, this one particular, uh, you know, I'm thinking of, for example, Eowyn from Lord of the Rings, the, the infamous, I am no man scene. Amazing. Great. Cinematically played really well. We have gone past that where the shocking reveal is that a woman is capable of swordsmanship where, you know, the shocking reveal that um, the main character is a black man who's also a wizard and the protagonist. We've, we've, we've right. gone well past that. And um, when we, when writers acknowledge that and share that, that is what I feel is, to me, good representation. I could be very, I could be very, you know, that's, you know, my representation might be different than someone else's and, and the other people might have different opinions, but that's the, should be the beauty of storytelling is in an ideal world, there's something for everyone. And, you know, there's, there's a way that people can feel seen and acknowledged uh, without being detrimental to others who don't feel the same way. Cause we're all on different paths. Sure. It's all just different yeah. flavors of the same human experience. Right. There's my right. spiel. <laughs> No, another great speed. I will tell you though, when Eowyn pulls off, I, hopefully I don't like lose all res all of your respect, whatever respect I had. But when she pulls off, because I'm already guessing it was pretty low, but when she pulls off the helmet and goes, "I am no man," and stabs the <laughs> stabs a dude in the face, I liked that because it was it was. Um, gosh, I wish I could remember the name of the. The, the the singer i cannot think of who it was but i was like a very young kid and there was there was a song called i i am woman i remember in it oh yeah i am i am woman hear me roar mm -hmm. I, I think it's in in numbers too big to ignore i'm trying to remember all the lyrics and 
I'll, I'll, maybe I'll put it in the show notes so that people can hear it for real. But I remember, because I was really young, I was like maybe five or something when I remember hearing this song and I thought, great, listen to this person taking taking that and, and saying it is my power. Mm -hmm. Like I liked that. I liked, you know, Eowyn pulling off oh, yeah. and going, I am no man. And, you know, because it's like, listen, you thought you couldn't be killed by a man. Ha ha, fucker. You know, Surprise, that, like, I like you that. forgot about me. Right. Well, and it that's my that, power. <clears throat> and I, I loved that scene as well for very similar okay, reasons. Good. And <laughs> my, my thought mostly is, is that, um, that was, a, that, that, that was a revolutionary mind blowing reveal for contemporaries of Tolkien's time. And that there sure. was, a, that there was a woman capable of this and, and within the world building, it makes sense. But, you know, in the same way that Ursula K. Le Guin was getting slammed for diversity sure. of race, uh, you know, there were, there were similar reactions about Eowyn's reveal in the, in the books when they originally, you know, happened. Mm, and that's okay. the part where I'm like, we've, we've gone past that. And there's actually, this is a, this I mean, is a weird quick, comparison. Quick, can I inject one quick thing? I'm sorry to, to interrupt them. Go back to it. But like, that's fine. In, in Tolkien's time, in Tolkien's place, like I mean, women, women who were who were warriors was not unknown. I mean, mm -hmm. Bodica, right? And that's who went the against thing. The Romans. Yes, despite yeah, this, re no, despite this, readers of his time still acted like this was a mind blowing okay. thing, which is like right, gotcha. that's kind of like that's kind of like the 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 thing that I'm getting at is like we've we've I, I feel like we should have as a society have transcended the need for the shock right, value sorry. to be that someone of a certain race, gender, sexuality can do that. Like yeah, of course, like that you know, <laughs> right. in, in in a in a similar and when I I think because I I loved I remember so clearly watching. The Lord of the Rings films for the first time as as a young teenager, the day after Thanksgiving, sitting on the couch eating Thanksgiving leftovers uh, in the middle of trying to put up the Christmas tree. That is a very it's a seared in my brain. I remember this moment well, and I remembered it again when um, the I guess people fast forward through the next two minutes if you don't want Mad Max Fury Road spoilers. But there's a similar <laughs> scene actually to the, to the the helmet reveal thing where our our main female character Furiosa she's about to um, uh, take out the man who uh, kidnapped her and made her work for him and, and did terrible things to people that she was trying to save. And he has a mask on his face. And if he gets this mask ripped off, he's going to die. And she, uh, Furiosa gets right in his face and she's like near death herself. Cause she got stabbed and she gets into his face and Charlize Theron, the actress who portrays Furiosa, like killed this. She gets in his face. And it, the only thing I can describe it as is when people talk about like female rage, that was what was inherited in the scene. And she, she hooks, um, her, she hooks something under the mask and goes, remember me? And then rips it off his face. And it is like the same sort of moment of like, that is female rage inherent. And it's made better yeah. when you know the whole story of like what this man did to her. Um, but the focus of the narrative was, was that it was her as a person that took him out. It was made better by the sure. fact that she was a woman, but okay. her as a person. And that's the sort of thing is like, you know, I, I think that, you know, we, like you said, it's all we've women have always been black people have always been queer people have always been capable of yes. many terrifying, amazing, wonderful, <laughs> right. show stopping things. It'd be great if stories would uh, catch up to that a little bit faster. Yeah. And the people who read them yeah. would catch up to it a little bit faster because it's just it's getting kind of sad at this point. <laughs> like, come on, gang, really? Like, we haven't gotten to this stage. I think that we'll and like, you know, we're closer than we used to be. But there's still like there's things that are missing and that. um as a, as a storyteller, I'm trying to, I'm trying to fix that in the ways that I can with my experience right. and, and right. knowledge and the own, the other things that I want represented. And for me, a lot of it is, um, you know, chronically ill and disabled people can still do things, still do accomplish things, things yeah. stop the end of right. the world, whatever, you know, that's just my, right. I write apocalyptic fiction. So that's my thing, <laughs> but yeah, like it's, it is, it is what it is. And, you know, even I, I have one short story that got published a couple of years ago and, um, and I, I st stuck to my my ethos of one of the two. There's only two characters, and one of the two main characters is non-binary. And it's just the the the, the character's name is slightly masculine. Their name's Dante, but um, they use they them pronouns. And it's just there in the narration. Uh, the, the the narrator character refers to them as they, and that's it. That's that on that. There's no sure. 
it's just casual representation is kind of what I try to be about because there should be no explanation needed. It's just, this is a human being with a human experience and an identity and it is what it is. Leave it alone. (laughs) I'm I'm with you on that. (laughs) I have one, one last thing I want to ask you too, because you touched on it. And these two questions are the, the two thoughts I have are, are related, but you, you touched on, on, token like token characters you have the token Mm -hmm. you know if you're gonna have somebody disabled it's got to be somebody in like a wheelchair like an electric wheelchair and if you're gonna have you know a transgender character it's not just like a transgender or a non-binary person it's like drag queen wearing big long nails Mm -hmm. type thing if you're gonna have somebody gay then it's got to be you know it's really almost caricatures of this of of the representation so the the question I want to ask you, I mean, like, if you get to that point where you're doing token representation, like, is that worse, first of all? But then then in a related way, like, how much is enough then? Like, how? Yeah, let me stop. <laughs> I think the, the token representation thing was a thing that I thought about a lot, especially when, you know, railing against the lack of it in my thesis. Mm-hmm. I don't sure. think... I think that they're both token representation and lack of representation. I think that they're both harmful, just in different directions. When you create, like you said, a caricature of a character, you are then uh, as a, as a storyteller saying something about the group you claim to represent us. And and that something is, it can be often very harmful in the real world and have very real world consequences for how people are treated. It's the, it's the old adage of, you know, life imitates art. It's also the other way around. If people see it in media, they're going to think it's okay. And that can often have, you know, very, and, and while a storyteller is not necessarily, it's not, they're not responsible for what people do after reading their book, watching the movie, whatever. Um, there is a certain level of like a cultural imperative I find uh, in the same way as though, you know, I'm trying to write the representation that I wish to see into the world in the hopes that more people take up the mantle. There's the dark side to it of like, if this is the, if this is the oft perpetrated caricature, there's no incentive to stop unless it's proven to be incorrect, bad, harmful, socially unacceptable, whatever. Right. Sure. On the flip side, when you have no representation, uh, then, then you get, you know, entire groups of people that are deemed as not worthy of being seen, being reflected, being, uh, you know, explained, being shown as valid sure. members of society. And again, it, life imitates art. If you, you know, it, it says something about a Going back to Ursula K. Le Guin, it says something about society that the reveal that her main character, the protagonist, the wizard, was a black man. That says something. The response, the response to that fiction in the real world, says something about who is considered valuable, who is considered worthy, quote unquote. And right. y- you know, it's again not a perfect solution, but if you are going to represent people in your stories, and you're going to choose some and not others without clear explanation that says something. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying that to go to the point of like tokenization, I'm not saying you should include everyone for the sake of including everyone, but that's where I go back to the casualness. If you can casually add these elements to reflect the world in which we live, a world that is wonderfully diverse in every way imaginable, it costs you nothing to do that. And it goes a long way in moving the needle on representation, becoming casual, accepted, no longer a thing that is, you know, groundbreaking and, and, and unimaginably complicated. It just is what it is because the world is what it is. Um, And the representation being enough, that's honestly not, I don't say it as a cop up, but just, this is the only answer I could ever find as I was reflecting on this, but I, I don't think that that's something that any one person can answer. And I think that when we, I often think about, there was a conversation, I spend a lot of time in, in fandom, and there's a lot of conversation on Tumblr um, about this topic as well, starting from when I was a teenager. And sure. there was often, on t- in TV shows as well, there seemed to be this notion of like, okay, we have one queer character, that's enough. That's enough representation yeah. oh, for them. And right. and I don't think yeah. that's cool. I don't like that. And I and that's why, like, there's, again, there's a, the dark side. The dark side is, you know, if we leave it up to publishers, showrunners, corporations to decide when it's enough. There's such a narrow margin for representation that you get to the tokenization of, oh, we have this one character in a wheelchair. That's enough. Not the only disability in the world, but they've decided that that's, that's good enough. Um, yeah. and, and, and it's, it's harmful because 
again, these are, and, and these are the people that make the money off of the stories that are told. So if they're saying, oh, that's enough, then that severely limits the pool from which they can draw in terms of competent storytellers who are willing to share. I remember, um, I, I don't remember enough to cite the sources, but I do remember reading something about how, um, there were two shows at this airing at the same time, How to Get Away with Murder and Scandal. And both of them were like legal-ish, political-ish dramas. And it was a big deal at the time that there were two shows of very similar, uh, you know, style, genre, even caliber with black women as the leads. This was mm. unheard of in the genre. Uh, and because there was the, the, the implication was that there was this overwhelming sentiment that, oh, there's one, you know, black-led TV show. That's enough. That's good enough. And, and that's not... That's not the way that ain't it. So, you know, so, you know, for me, I, I care, I care about quality. If, you know, I, I told, I've told this story to many people before, but uh, when I was a young ish person, uh, when I was a teenager and this is very, I was like, it was 2014. This is indicative of like the internet in my sphere. I wanted to read books with chronically ill characters. I wanted representation. And I went to my local library because that's where I hang out. And I asked my, my local librarian if she could help me because I, my Google searches were returning nothing. But I also know that you can't find everything on Google. Sure. And the only, the only book that she could find to offer me was The Fault in Our Stars by John Green. And for those who don't know, The Fault in Our Stars by John Green is about terminally ill cancer patients. <laughs> Not exactly what I was looking for. Mm-hmm. The, and yeah, like, not exactly I, I'm chronic, not terminally ill. But... Yes, I'm. I'm not. I'm not terminally ill. I'm chronically yeah. ill. I'm not going to Which die good, anytime soon. I'm, yeah, I'm very glad to hear it. Me, thank you. Me too. I'm knocking on wood. That doesn't change. But you know, it's. It speaks to it. W- that was what lit a fire under me. That and yeah, the Toni sure. Morrison quote I came across a few weeks later that said, "If you want to read something, but it hasn't been written yet, you must be the one to write it." And yeah. I was like, "All right, bet," because there was a problem. And and so you know if. And again, it was like, you know, publishing said, okay, here's this critically acclaimed book about terminally ill cancer patients. Good enough. Whatever. Uh, You know, but then the next book series that I read had casual queer representation, disability representation on two fronts and uh, a very diverse cast of characters in terms of race. This is this is also young adult. The Fault in Our Stars is young adult as well. Um, then I, I happen to turn to this because uh, I love fantasy and sci-fi. Queer fantasy two book series by Lee Bardugo. Um, the first book is called Six of Crows. If anyone listening yes. has watched Shadow and Bone on Netflix, this is the the source material for some of that. And this. This YA book series did numbers. It is legendary in publishing to really? this day because okay. of how well it did. And it is an ensemble cast. There is a character who is disabled and uses a cane. There is a character who uh, has ADHD. There's, a, there's another character who is dyslexic. There are uh, three out of the six main characters are not white. Three out of the six main characters are women. And it is all casual. It's just there. They just happen to be disabled queer awesome. whatever yeah. and it's and i was like okay this this sets the bar this is what it is and and thankfully publishers did not look at that and say oh that's good enough that's more than good enough and the trend has thus continued sure. Sure. so i don't I, I no one person i think can say whether or not there's enough representation but you know the 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 con- the companies the g- cl- conglomerations of people that have the power need to say, oh, that's good enough less, I think, because that's how we sure. get into sure. this particular situation that we're in where, um, you know, you get, you know, the, even if it's not overtly stated, the feeling of, oh, that's that's good enough then. We have we have the one, that's good enough. And that's yeah, not, sure. because if nothing else, that's not reflective of the world in which we live. If nothing else, you know, what if what if you looked at your podcast and was like, oh, there's one, there's one queer person, that's good enough, then I wouldn't be sitting here. It's that same sort of, you know, on a tiny, tiny True. scale, but it's the same sort of vibe of like, you know, you know, oh, that's, that's, that's good enough. Like we don't need any yeah. more of that is the wrong, I believe that's the wrong tactic to take across many functions, not even remotely related to gender, sexuality, sure. disability, sure. whatever. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's, that's kind of where I sit on that in terms of, you know, I know what kind of, I know how much representation I would feel would be good enough for me in, in a book or in a movie, but that's not, right. could be someone right. else's experience could be totally different. But I think the, the larger conversation around what's, what's good enough. Um, it needs to change in my opinion, from an attitude of we're clearly just ticking a box of representation so that viewers shut up 
to, you know, we're, we're doing this because it makes sense. I'll, I'll shut up after this. Cause I have one more, actually, this just came into my brain, really great analogy of <laughs> being on the screen. So, um, representation sometimes can come at cost. And sometimes I think that cost is okay. An example being uh, the, the, the book series that I grew up with because I am who I am and I will never change is a, is a young adult uh, fantasy kind of like Greek mythology in the modern age series called Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Percy Jackson. Yes. I know. The title now the, the, <laughs> the title is very uh, well known to people now because it was just made into a Disney plus original television series. When the I, cast actually, now now this actually I actually I didn't know that. Oh yeah, it, yes, <laughs> it it's great. But now here, no, 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 it's fine. So this this will be interesting. That so uh, the the fans of the show are split into two camps. You've got you know young people who are watching it for the first time, and then you sure. got people my age who grew up on yes. this. Right. We are strapped in. We are prepared. We had two botched movie adaptations that were terrible for reasons that have nothing to do with representation, everything to do with that they were terrible. <laughs> we're ready okay. for this. So. When the casting came out, there was an uproar on two fronts. The first one is uh, the one of the main characters in the story. Her name is Annabeth. She is described in the books as being white, blonde-haired, and gray-eyed. The producers, the directors, and the author himself determined that the best actress to play the part is a young black woman. And no, everyone flipped out. And it was ridiculous. Why, Why would Rick Reardon do that? A, do you know, or...? He, he said that he felt that she was the best from the character representation perspective to play the part of Annabeth. She had, she had the je ne sais quoi. She had the sure. skill because it was very important to them that they cast 12 year olds to play actual 12 year olds. And so, you All know, right. out of, Good out of point. the pool of applicants, she was the best equipped to do the sure. job. And, and so they said, and, who cares about appearance, yeah, physical because, appearance? Let's get the right yes. character. Okay. Yes. Because I'm her physical sure appearance dislike this so we'll go ahead maybe her, i should wait her, well her physical appearance really in the books it didn't really move the needle on her character development yeah, it was just sure. one of the hallmarks of being a child of athena was that they were okay. blonde haired and gray eyed but that okay. was it it had no it didn't move the needle in literally any other way and so they chose you know they picked the person best for the job because at the end of the day like i guess acting it is a job it's, it's a job application yeah. she she yeah. fit the part and then it was the same thing with another character he was he was portrayed in um, official art and kind of depicted to be in the books. He was white and they cast a young Indian boy. And okay. again, I think that's great because again, his physical appearance, the character's physical appearance had nothing to do with his character sure. and, you know, love it, love it or hate it. I respect this approach of these actors are doing a job. We wanted to cast age appropriate actors who were the yeah. best fit to portray these characters, their nuances, their struggles, their experiences. The people we picked best for the job don't look like the books, but, they're the people that are best for the job. And now as a result, you know, for, cause for a, like most of a lot of my generation who grew up reading fantasy and sci-fi, you know, there were not a lot of characters that were people of color. And so sure. all I keep thinking is, you know, how awesome, you know, when, when, it, cause I also had a brief moment of like discomfort with the fact that, you know, Annabeth wasn't going to be blonde hair, gray eyed, but then I immediately, I went in my head, how awesome is it going to be that two generations of young black women or, or black women who used to be young when they yes, read these books right, get to right. see an Annabeth that looks like that because for so many of us, she was it. She was the female heroine of our generation. Sure, sure. And now, you know, we had our time with white Annabeth, like, okay, whatever. But now, you know, young black girls get to see this awesome, badass, sword swinging, super genius young woman off to save the world with her two moron best friends. Like that is, I am very glad that young black girls get to have that. I'm very glad that black women of every age get to have that because it is still, unfortunately, underrepresented in in sure. the field of young adult storytelling. Yeah. And yeah. because because of that, and because I I feel it's you know the right thing to do as a storyteller is you put the character first. And I I agree. I, I think that that was a very smart play on behalf of the storytellers. And you know it's one of those things where this representation matters sure from a book to screen adaptation standpoint it's not accurate but the real world impact of that decision is going to move mountains in terms of representation and i think that that's Agreed. pretty darn cool especially Agreed. for young people who are yeah. not white who are not straight who are not you know whatever it's it's good it makes me very happy to see when people in power choose to move the needle in that way that's when we're going to keep having the forward motion instead of the backward motion yeah. that we've you yeah. know seen so there's that's my yeah. that's my final <laughs> final rant of the day <laughs> I, 
you know, but but it actually there was something I was I was unsure I wanted to bring up, but but now now you've sort of forced it out of me because <laughs> when I when I have seen um I mean, I guess for lack of a better way to put of putting it, you know, gender fluid or or not, you know, non-binary, you know, transgender characters, typically it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And it makes me feel a little uncomfortable because I don't want the, there are two reasons. First of all, like right now, transgender is I, I'm not sure if you've if you know this, but but there's kind of a, you know, people don't like transgender. But there are certain sectors of the population not very enthusiastic about the transgender community and trying to regulate you know, some of mm-hmm. us out of existence. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that. And I don't want to go, there's not a mm-hmm. political statement I'm going to make here other than to say, I, it makes me uncomfortable because first of all, it, it puts the spotlights on yep. transgender people. So mm-hmm. I don't, I don't like the spotlight. And I guess I said it was two reasons. It's kind of the same reason mm-hmm. because by putting the spotlight on transgender people, it sort of destroys my point that that gender identity is absolutely universal, that each of us mm-hmm. develops gender identity. And so by saying, oh, yeah, and this person here is is transgender, that we have to stick this into that we have to have representation implies mm-hmm. that there's a difference. I don't like that. And that's, you know, yeah. that's my little that's my little spiel. But but like it's when I have read it in in fiction or seen it in movies, t- typically I get a little bit uncomfortable. I, for some reason, mm-hmm. Sailor Moon did not because I was kind of like everybody, you know, is kind of yeah, you know nondescript there. here. But yeah, but, but when it's when it's overt, when it becomes mm-hmm. when, overt's not the right word, but when it's explicit, I think is the word I want to yeah. use. When it's explicit, even if it's done well, I still kind of go. Like, did you have and to I, do that? Did you? Yeah, and it, right. And even if it's true, I mean, even when it's the truth of, of our society that you go, look, there mm-hmm. are transgender people that it, you that don't have to is. underscore it in big red letters. You just, you can just, it can just be there. And, and I guess, I guess maybe that's the point. Yeah. I don't, I don't like the spotlight on the transgender community and I absolutely mm-hmm. don't like the idea of making transgender people appear you know special or different mm-hmm. in some way you know and and so it's so it's a difficult like for me it's a difficult balance because you talk about um you know the percy jackson movie or movies uh series let's say coming out you know that it's going to be a 12 year old young 12 year old black girl it's like that's phenomenal right because her, the identity, you know, the physical identity meant nothing to the story. Mm-hmm. But when I do see something where, where gender does mean something to the story, I don't know. Was, I, I feel like I just really, you know, went nowhere with this statement other than to say that representation, I think, is great. It, and unless it highlights something, unless it highlights something that needs no highlights. Exactly. Can, it should just be a we, stated fact. I guess so. People, yeah, it, yeah, I agree. And, you know, it's... I guess so, yeah. I remember I, um, I was in conversation with a literary agent once um, in my my course of trying to get traditionally published, and he, uh, I had verbally pitched my manuscripts to him, mm-hmm. and uh, he had asked to know if the author uh, was portraying characters that shared their lived experience. And and I was, if they were comfortable doing so. And I had said, yeah, I, I am chronically ill as is my main character. And he looked at me and he said, this is emblematic of the industry that I'm even having to ask you this question, but are you prepared to, should you get representation and this book gets published, you know, people, you know, in the court of the internet's public opinion, you might be, yeah. you know, asked, demanded to defend that you're queer enough, sick enough, whatever, to write these yes, characters. Right, are you right. prepared to do that? And I said, am I prepared for people to ask me to? Yeah. Am I going to defend myself? No, because it's a stated fact of humanity that there are queer, yeah. chronically ill, trans, yeah. non-binary people in this world, and it needs no introduction. If they don't like it, they can sit down and shut up. I obviously said it in a more, you know, business appropriate, speaky way, sure, but that's sure. my attitude. Is like you said, it 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 should need no explanation. It should need no introduction. It just it is it is what it is. As yeah. I as I often yeah. say around my house, it is what it is, and it be what it be. Like we are just, yeah. he- and you know, people. 
people can loudly demand explanations for the way that we are all they want, but we are not required to give it, nor are they entitled to it. And if they don't like that, uh, they can, they can move on and find something else to do with their time. That might be more enriching. Read a book, watch a movie, take a nap. It's good for you. (laughs) Who doesn't need a nap these days? (laughs) Pretty much nobody. So true. Thank you for pulling that together. Cause that actually made my point better than I could have made it. So (laughs) Um, I think on that though, I, you know, I, I want to, gosh, you know, when we talked the first time, I want to say it was in one of those speed connection things. It was right. And then we just got on the phone and talked for about six hours or so, something like that. (laughs) It was close to, I mean, it might've been two, but it was a long time. Um, I think very highly of you. I, you know, I appreciate the time you've taken to talk to me, especially with, you know, the expertise you bring into the conversation, of course, right back at you. So, well, thank right back you. at you. <laughs> thank you. I yeah. very much appreciate it. And uh, I will, so there will be links to, um, you know, various ways to get in touch with Amanda. And uh, we do that look again. Oh, my. <laughs> do you know what that is? I still is have... Oh, it was cute. I loved it. Thank you. Yes. Come, come at, hit me up anytime. Uh, my website and LinkedIn will be there. And if you ever want to, uh, as they, as the kids say, send me a DM on LinkedIn. I have book recommendations depending on your preferred flavor. So if you just want a book recommendation, come find me. I have lots of them. Please let me put my master's degree to good use. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So again, thank you, Amanda. I appreciate everything. What a great conversation. Likewise. Thank you. This was great.